All right, and I'm gonna uh, return to our PowerPoint presentation. And... Okay, hopefully people can see the, the PowerPoint presentation once again. Yep. Um, just as we always do, just reminding people our project goals haven't changed and, and these are really highlighted in our draft plan as well. Uh, the goals are to increase uh, commercial opportunities and neighborhood serving businesses, increasing housing affordability and choices, expand active and green transportation. And with the improvements we're recommending, we'd also, uh, we have recommendations for community stabilization strategies. And it's, it's worthwhile to highlight these again, because um, as you're going through the plan, uh, it'd be great if you could uh, yeah, highlight whether you think that the recommendations in the plan are helping to forward the project goals or not. Yeah, just a, a key thing to bear in mind. Uh, this, this plan is definitely not doing everything uh, uh, in terms of all the needs that are in, uh, in the community, but hopefully it's forwarding these project goals. Okay, uh, our update is really about the, the project timeline. And just want to highlight where we are right now in terms of the near term. Uh, you should all have received uh, via email uh, the early review draft that we sent out to the PAC. And we also sent it out to the, the technical advisory committee, which is uh, mostly city bureaus that went out on March 24th. And you should have received a part one and part two to the plan and also a zoning changes map. And uh, let Shane or myself know if you did, did not receive them. And we're hoping to have your comments by uh, April 10th, so just a little bit over a week. Um, and uh, you can send those comments to, again, Shane or myself in, in whatever form would be useful to you. And also feel free to contact us if you, you wanted to, to speak to us more directly. And our aim and, and why we're uh, asking for those comments by April 10th is to release the discussion draft for uh, the broader public review by the last week of April. And I've got April 24th down, but that could change depending upon how many changes uh, we make. Uh, the, the key uh, goal we have for having you as the PAC review the plan is to, to help us make refinements before it goes out to the broader public. So you're basically uh, receiving a kind of a sneak peek of the plan, and uh, we definitely want to hear your input and use that to refine the plan before it goes out to the broader public. And just one thing we wanted to highlight too is we're really wanting uh, this draft plan in its current form to be something that's really primarily reviewed by the advisory committee uh, rather than uh, being shared out broadly broadly with the public. We're, we're really, when we go out broadly to the public, it should be when we have the discussion draft for finance in place. Um, and then coinciding with the release of the, uh, the, early, uh, the discussion draft, we want to go uh, pretty big with our public engagement, which we'll be talking to you about later in the presentation. And we anticipate that happening as soon as we release the draft plan. And it'll take place for about six weeks, at least through uh, early June. But any comments about the, the project timeline? And I should mention too, we, we don't have a specific, the next step after the discussion draft is we take the public input and we make refinements before creating the, the proposed draft, which is what will be reviewed by the, the planning commission. We don't have a date for that, but it'd likely be sometime in the summer or even the early fall. Anna? Yeah, I have a question about, um, so the, the discussion draft public engagement that starts in April, um, that means we are also allowed to share that with our other organizations to discuss things and not before, I guess. Yeah, uh, we're wanting to make the refinements based on comments we hear from you and the TAC before we go out to the broader public. So yes, in terms of uh, sharing it with you know, neighborhood committees and such, uh, our intention is that that happens during the discussion draft period. Okay. And is there is there a um, concept of how that will be facilitated, so people actually get to know? I mean, they all have questions, I assume. And yes, um, <laughs> uh, we're gonna go through 
our draft strategy for public outreach after we we go through the plan and uh we're interested in uh the advisory committee's thoughts and, on the, the approach we're we're looking at at this time okay thank you sure scott did you want to say something here you good well i was i think i know what the answer is but when the public engagement happens um is it cool that are we part of like the promoting of that and talking to all of our groups is that part of the expect not expectation necessarily, but we have that option available to us to share this out, right? Yeah, that'd be, be great uh, yeah. if advisory committee members went to help spread the word. The, <laughs> the more the merrier in terms of getting the word out there and, and uh, helping maybe direct people's input uh, so that staff can hear that uh, that feedback. Nancy put in the chat that the 82nd Avenue Parade is on the 29th of April. If, um, we want if that's an event we want to show up at. Okay, that's something uh, to keep in mind. Uh, is there another meeting, say in May, uh, that the 82nd Avenue group would have, in case we don't get the plan out by by April 29th? I'm not sure if you're if you're talking about the the work that Peabot is doing on 82nd, but that's something we can definitely take a look at. Okay, good. Any other comments in the, this piece? I think we're good. Okay. Um, well, uh, we're going to launch right into just providing you a, a, an overview of what's in the plan. I'm going to share uh, part one, which is uh, basically the introduction to the plan and the community development piece. And uh, uh, I'm going to just I'm going to run through the PDF and let you know what's in it, highlight some things that have, that are new. Uh, and if you have questions on the sections as I go through them, please uh, bring that up, uh, bring it up. And uh, we're definitely interested in any initial feedback you might have at this point. Um, Shane and I were thinking it might be best if we wait for people to share their comments uh, till we get through each one of the parts, uh, just uh, so we can... Um, come through this or get through it uh, in a timely manner. But if, if they're clarifying questions, definitely uh, put those out there as I'm, I'm running through the plan. And I'm gonna stop screen sharing the presentation and switch over to something else. All right, uh, can people see the plan? Yes. All right, I'm gonna, hopefully it won't get people too dizzy because uh, I'm probably gonna just run through this. And, and Shane, if you could just, uh, flag for me if, if people raise their hands or have any comment. Um, all right. Uh, and I should mention too that we're still working on the formatting. So uh, as you might know, there's there's a very different creative approach for part one and part two. And at some point, we're probably going to bring them together to one approach. Okay. So uh, part one, it's our introduction and community development section. So this includes all the proposals related to the land use changes. I'm not going to get to any great detail about uh, the introduction. Uh, I should highlight, however, that uh, much of what we've been talking about over the last several months in the, the PAC have ended up in the plan. We've added some additional background information that's come from other pieces of the plan. So it's, it's basically, it's bringing together all sorts of things that have already been shared out during the course of the plan. Um, and I do want to highlight that, again, this is a kind of a focus plan. It has three basic kinds of proposals. There are land use changes, uh, uh, potential transportation projects or recommendations for transportation projects, and community stabilization approaches to uh, uh, avoid displacement. That, that's stuff we had shared with you in the past. Uh, we have some nifty historic images of the area. I really like the lower image, which is of 82nd in the Favelle area from 1934, how radically it's changed. 82nd is not the same country road it once was, uh, clearly. But um, uh, you know, take a look at the, the, the history section and past plans. It's pretty summary. Our intent was to kind of get to the, the meat of the or the core of the plan uh, before boring people too much with background information. So it's, it's, it's fairly short. Um, we have a section, and uh, Shane was uh, pretty key in pulling this together about Lower Southeast today, 
and uh, the assets and aspirations uh, in the area. We wanted to be sure that we're highlighting not just the, the shortcomings or the issues or problems in the area, but what people like about Lower Southeast. That's something uh, we heard from some in the community that you know, focus on some of the positives, uh, why people want to be here. So that's uh, the intent of this fairly you know, community voice focused uh, short section. Uh, we do move on to the needs and issues in the area, uh, a lot having to do with the, the lack of access to uh, neighborhood commercial services in the area, uh, also uh, the, the lack of affordable housing opportunities, uh, and a range of other things. So take a look at that. We have a, a section that's focusing on kind of the equity dimensions of issues in Lower Southeast. And then a, a section which is new that's looking at how the plan relates to health issues in the area. And uh, this section and other sections are highlighting some of the implementation approaches that, that have a relationship to uh, health. Uh, and then we, we go through some of the, the public, the summarizing the public engagement and the land use scenarios that are uh, part of last year's community engagement. And this highlights how we got to the preferred scenario. Again, I'm not gonna, I'm just running through what's in there, really encourage you to, to take a closer look. Um, and from there, we go from that community input, the, the community's concepts for uh, centers and corridors, especially the idea of anchoring the neighborhood with services and uh, focusing growth uh, and housing opportunities on our corridors into this, um, we're calling our, I'm sorry, I'm gonna back up just a touch. I was uh, getting ahead of myself, but uh, one section I'd encourage people to take a look at is there's a, a community development vision for the future page. And this is intended uh, uh, based on what we heard from the community and, and uh, this group, what is it we're trying to achieve in the lower Southeast area? What are all these uh, land use changes and transportation improvements intended to uh, lead to? And this includes the objectives that, uh, that have been a big part of the plan up to now as well. So I encourage uh, people to take a look at that and let us know if we're on the right track for capturing at least a short snapshot vision for the future. Um, from there, we move on into a, a growth concept section. And this is highlighting the various elements, the land use elements of the plan. There's a very cluttered land use growth concept that starts the series of diagrams. Um, and then we break it down into the various elements of the growth concept. So it goes onto a page that's focusing on the, the, the new proposed neighborhood center. That's, uh, of course, in the lower right, the Brentwood Darlington uh, new neighborhood center. And uh, then the idea of focusing housing growth and uh, the small commercial areas uh, along the 52nd Avenue and 72nd Avenue corridors. And uh, then we break it down further into uh, highlighting some of the smaller commercial areas that some of the land use changes are intended to support and enhance with uh, the zoning. And this next diagram is just showing in very general terms where the, the commercial zoning is proposed uh, as part of the plan. Uh, we have that as well showing just where the multifamily zoning is proposed along those corridors and in the neighborhood center. Also, uh, just a very uh, simple diagram highlighting how some of the land use components relate to uh, the circulation or transportation that works in the area. So that's, uh, again, moving on. Uh, moving on after the concept, uh, we're looking at some of the comprehensive plan changes and the zoning changes would, that would implement those concepts. And this includes, uh, a, a change to our comprehensive plan, identifying where we have neighborhood centers. So we have a, a, a new little circle for uh, a Brentwood Darlington neighborhood center and uh, adding Southeast 52nd and Southeast 72nd to our network of neighborhood corridors. Next section is focusing on the zone changes. We have a convention here where to uh, avoid some of the background clutter. We're just highlighting the proposed zone changes here. Um, so showing what the current zoning is and what the, the proposed new zone is in each uh, quadrant uh, of the plan area. And these are, for the most part, things we had already discussed uh, in, in uh, 
our discussions of the zone changes in the area. One thing I wanted to highlight is uh, a concept we had had was to uh, apply a significant amount, about 13 acres of commercial mixed use zoning, CM2 zoning uh, along 82nd from about uh, Knapp down to Lambert. Um, and there was a fair amount of internal discussion about this at BPS. And there was concerns about losing employment land um, on the 82nd Avenue corridor. And of course, employment and jobs are key goals of the city. So we scaled back the, the area that's proposed for the zone change to CM2 to uh, uh, more tightly oriented towards Flaville. Uh, basically, the, the, the properties that are directly fronting Flaville and 82nd and extending down to uh, the motel south of Flaville. Um, any questions about that? or anything I, I brought up up to now? Pam left a comment just asking for access to the health assessment memo that's referenced as Appendix X. Um, just making sure we get that to them before this review period is over if they wanna take a glance at it. Sure, um, I can share that with the group. It's uh, still drafty, not quite where we want it to be for sharing to the broader public, but I think for this group, uh, we can share that health assessment. No, it was very interesting to us and some new information. So thank you. Sure. Um, you know, one thing uh, that may not have been clear in past discussions was uh, we have a little area outlined in yellow at the 72nd and Faville node and the 82nd and Faville node. And part of the concept there is there would be a requirement that the ground floor areas and those core commercial areas, and these are places that where it's all commercial uses right now, uh, you would have to include ground floor commercial as part of future development there uh, to ensure that those those hubs really retain a commercial function and you don't get purely um, residential development happening at those those core areas. Okay, um, just going to run through the rest of part one. Um, we have a summary of some of the transportation projects in very short form uh, in the next section. I'm not gonna go into those in any great detail, but they're, they correspond to what's shown in, more, in much greater detail in part two. And last but not least, we have a, our community stabilization section, which uh, includes the actions that would help support community uh, stability and affordability. And, we broke this down by things that would be adopted with the plan, uh, which are largely zoning code related, and those which are going to be recommendations or ongoing collaboration that would be happening uh, as improvements happen in the plan area. Okay, I'm going to um, stop sharing and uh, see if there are any questions. Um, well, actually, Besides question, I'd, questions, I'd say uh, if you have any initial comments, if you've had a chance to look at the plan, definitely uh, we'd be interested in hearing those and, and seeing if there's some discussion we could have uh, on those initial comments. I just had a comment. Um, sorry, I didn't see if somebody called to me. This is Misa. I'm from Brentwood, Darlington, and uh, just having advocated for this neighborhood for so long, uh, it's hard to be kind of lumped in with Woodstock and Lentz and uh, Foster as this lower Southeast and what we need, because what we need is so different than what those neighborhoods need, I think, because um, we're lacking so much uh, infrastructure and business and and I just wanted to reiterate, because you kind of skimmed over it, the map that the focus area is Brentwood Darlington in in the whole project piece. Um, I just always want to bring that up. So thanks. Yeah, so now that's a good point. And uh, uh, the big reason we had the project area map at the beginning, highlighting that the, the focus area and where a lot of the, uh, the greatest amount of work is, is in Brentwood Darlington. Uh, Nick. Um, yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, a few things, and you know, one is I just encourage um, 
being um, more assertive, I guess, about um, the residential density in the centers that we're trying to promote the both from the term of um, trying to develop commercially as well as trying to provide housing for people that really need it. Um, this is really a long range plan. So thinking about what the neighborhood's going to be like, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years in the future is really important. Um, I, I guess the other thing I'd say is I think there's a real opportunity at the south end of 80 second and to think about that um, kind of triangle between 72nd Flavel and the spring water corridor as really being um, potential to have a, a nice district um, that's bike friendly and pedestrian friendly and um, yeah I, I'm not sure if the employment zoning um, is the right approach there I guess. Yeah, those uh, are definitely a, the employment and industrial zoning around the Springwater Corridor near 82nd has definitely been a, a key issue. Uh, the city has been doing an uh, employment opportunity analysis. There's some state requirements to show that we have enough capacity for, for jobs. And uh, a lot of the analysis has shown that we have lots of capacity for housing. Uh, our zoning for jobs is is more constrained. So there's there's some hesitancy to, to roll back the employment and industrial zoning uh, just to share what's happening in some of the uh, broader discussions. Um, you know, uh, I don't want to put you uh, on the spot too much, Nick, but um, I'm, I'm curious what people uh, think. You know, um, 72nd is an area that we're looking at uh, upzoning from basically town existing R2.5 townhouse single family zoning to at least the small scale multi-dwelling. And we're being somewhat conservative going for uh, the RM1 zone, which uh, is just a two to three story scale zone. Um, but there's also been con some conversation, do we go bigger? It's a, it's, um, it's a corridor that's intended to be a place where you have transit and where you have some commercial opportunities. I'm curious what the rest of the group thinks about yeah, do we stick to the two to three story multifamily on 72nd or, um, yeah, and I remember the, the existing context is for the most part, pretty low lying, you know, low scale houses, uh, but RM2 would provide more housing opportunity for the long term. If we're thinking about how this area develops over, you know, not just the next 10 years, but it, this could be, you know, the next 50 years uh, as we, we're hopefully achieving a lot more success in in tackling climate change. Any, any thoughts about going to the, the three to four story multifamily scale on 72nd versus uh, the, the two to three story multifamily scale? In the chat, Julie says, if bigger means more commercial real retail space, then yes. And then Michael and then Anna, Anna has her hands up. Yeah, I, I think the, that there is a, a really good argument for uh, more density. So if we have the opportunity to add zoning that increases density in this area, I think we should take it now and be bold about it. Um, I also had another question about the, the employment zoning. Is there a reason that that has to be hemmed in to a, a, a focused area and can't just be more broad? Um, what what's what's the reasoning for just keeping it in one area rather than just opening it up um, bro yeah. more broadly? Sure. Yeah. Um, if you're talking about uh, going our proposal to rezone from employment to commercial mixed use on 82nd, uh, we're keeping it pretty tight to Flaville on 82nd uh, just because of feedback we're receiving from uh, um, internal discussion. Um, uh, BPS has a, a, a lot of priority for making sure that we have enough employment lands to provide the jobs that are needed. Uh, so there was a lot of hesitancy to apply commercial mixed use zoning more broadly on 82nd. Uh, there's also a concern that um, if you allow residential, residential type development tends to outbid employment type development. Uh, so if we allow too much residential in places where we want to see jobs, all you may be seeing is you know some you know commercial and 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 some uh, uh, housing rather than getting things that are more employment 
in um, in character. Uh, but you know, we're interested in your thoughts because uh, you know, uh, there's also the fact that uh, the the properties in that stretch of 82nd in, in this potential neighborhood center are fairly small. They're they're not the large employment type uh, properties you have. Uh, uh, near, say, the Lentz Freeway lands or closer to the, the Springwater Corridor. But so I'm interested in people's thoughts about, about these. Uh, and Anna? Yeah, I mean, I, I think higher density along 72nd is really important. Um, and I see in, you know, in Woodstock um, with our discussions when, when people come and say like, oh, we need this commercial development. There's so much missing that we don't have. Um, and um, we do have uh, uh, people who would like to open certain stores. And then they said, like, it makes no sense whatsoever because we don't have the density of people actually using those stores. And I feel like there is a lot to, to be done to, to think about how you can get this kind of, um, you know, commercial or <laughs> consumer power, if you will, um, in order to support those services and, and stores that, that we all wish for in this kind of vision that we have of our vital urban uh, spaces. Um, but I also have another question, you know, especially when we are talking about community stabilization, um, where I feel like um, there are a lot more uh, um, possibilities to think about how we can develop businesses, small scale businesses. And if there are special programs that can be, you know, associated with these vision plans um, that you are proposing um, that become really part of a development strategy and that are kind of maybe not written in stone, but close to that. <laughs> so we actually really guide through because it doesn't help if we have like gigantic commercial development and then it drives out, um, you know, again, the healthy environment or this kind of um, public um, uh, spaces that we, that we wish for, that we see in, in other areas because we are so close to the spring water commercial corridor where it's really not nice <laughs> for the most part. So I wonder how, how, how is that envisioned to, to put in the vision plan to you know, have a good strategy that there's quality development. Yeah, the best tool we have for that, for like local um, economic development and you know, making sure we're providing opportunities for small businesses to stay and for people to establish small businesses has been um, uh, the Neighborhood Prosperity uh, Network. Uh, the J District, for example, uh, has a, a Neighborhood Prosperity uh, Initiative effort there, as does Cully and Park Rose. And um, in the community stabilization section, we do have uh, a rec recommendations for considering um, this area, and especially the neighborhood center as the location for a neighborhood prosperity network, um, uh, that would really provide more tools for, for looking at local economic development. Um, before we call on Michael, I just want to catch up on the chat. Um, Scott wrote that given the long-term plan nature of this plan, I really think planning for more housing capacity makes long-term sense, given how bad our housing shortage is right now. And then there's two other questions in there. Misa asks, uh, would the larger size departments or housing have a parking requirement? Um, Bill, do you have a response to that? A quick one, or is there a quick response? Um, basically, uh, well, if there's affordable units that meet affordability criteria, they do not need to provide off-street parking. Um, but if it's a large site and it's not near frequent transit service, and uh, then there are some requirements for parking and, and if they're not providing affordable units. We have uh, a couple of questions from uh, Pam. With respect to employment focus, is it possible to consider precision cast parts and the other industrial employers along Johnson Creek, just south of the study area? Um, just to clarify, Pam, when you say consider those, um, what, what do you mean? 
Well, earlier Bill was talking about uh, employment capacity and that influencing decisions about land use zoning on uh, 82nd, particularly the southern portion. And so if you're looking just within the defined study area, you know, possibly there's a stronger argument for including that as commercial or industrial zoning. But if you look a little bit more broadly as to where people are currently finding employment uh, for residents within Brentwood, Darlington and the study area, I mean, there's a lot of major employers just on the other side of our southern boundary. So. Um, seems sort of artificial not to be looking at that when you're looking at employment targets. Yep, um, and the concern of the loss of employment lands is a citywide concern. So it probably doesn't matter too much from, I think, some of that perspective, whether there are, are other employment lands nearby. You know, one reason we were looking at 82nd Faville as being a small commercial hub that we want to retain and grow was that the area it does have a number of, uh, I think at least five manufactured uh, home parks and low rise apartments. And those people up to now haven't been close to much of a commercial anchor. Uh, so if we do want people to be able to you know, live close to services, you know, that's part of the concept for uh, commercial node, both at 72nd and at 82nd. But you know, definitely interested in people's thoughts about this. Uh, whatever you provide in terms of your input about what's in the draft right now, we would want to share with the BPS management. So any concerns you have about those issues, um, definitely uh, chime in with uh, the comments that you provide. Um, with that, I, I'm going to, for the in the interest of uh, getting through the agenda, uh, I'm going to pass things to Shane now. Uh, but uh, if you do have questions, I'd be happy to uh, have you contact uh, me for land use things or, or Shane for any uh, transportation related questions. And again, yeah. get us get us the comments by uh, next Monday. That'd be fantastic. And Michael, if you want to pop your comment in the chat, we can try to, if we have some time, we can address it there. Um, yeah, let me pull up the part two, breeze through this. Too many windows. Here we go. You guys seeing something? <laughs> Got it. Bill, can, you can see it? Okay, yeah, cool. All right. Um, so in classic, uh, stereotypical fashion, the land use and transportation sections are siloed and they look quite different, but I promise that they're not as siloed as they may appear. Um, and uh, my first evidence there is that I'm gonna skip the first like 10 pages of this because it's pretty much identical in terms of content uh, to the part one that uh, Bill went through. You have the same introduction, plan purpose, a little snippet that's just previewing what's in the plan, um, that same assets and aspirations um, section where we're trying to bring to light some of the things that people love about the neighborhood. Props to Scott for doing a bunch of those um, sort of focused one-on-one -on -one interviews with individuals um, and with uh, organizations. And then we get into the transportation specific side of things. And this section is derived largely from um, the existing conditions exercise that we did, the needs analysis exercises that we've done, um, the number of um, community surveys that we've done or one-on-one or -on -one conversations. Um, and it's basically just the greatest hits. Uh, that's the best, it's kind of the sad, saddest hits, but greatest hits, uh, just the things that we're trying to address with this project. Street surfaces, pedestrian crossing gaps, missing sidewalks. You all as uh, community members in this neighborhood know um, this by now. Traffic volumes, uh, gaps in the bike network, um, some transportation safety issues on the busiest streets, uh, transit network that doesn't really take folks where they want to go, um, and commute mode share uh, by walking by bike and by transit that is for for similarly similar parts of, of town is is not quite where we would expect to see it. Um, and so having that table setting we jump into and I'm going to try to breeze through the the things that you guys have already seen or already familiar with. Um, but having that table setting, we jump into our project recommendations. And so we have this landing page where we talk broadly about 
what you're going to see here, we've got the, the two types of projects, the corridor improvements and the neighborhood greenways, speak about what those are, kind of talk about what the tiers are, what, those, what, what that means as far as prioritization and what you can expect timeline wise um, for, from us to do. And then we, we dive into um, the individual project types. We go into the corridor improvements first. Um, and so you have these kind of two landing pages where we're, we're showing all of the corridor improvement projects, the tier one and tier two projects, how they relate to the existing and the proposed centers, which are those hashed out areas uh, behind the projects on the map. We talk a little bit about the what, a, what corridor improvements are, what this family of project does. Uh, family of projects do. Uh, you've got the enhanced crossings, bike lanes, sidewalk infill, and alternative walkways. Um, this next section is, that's all stuff you guys have seen at least a little bit of. I'm not sure if we had cost estimates last time that we shared these, um, but um, basically a map that shows the sort of our best thinking about where things are going to go um, now, a cost estimate, a short description, uh, just a one-page summary. Um, and this is the part of the plan that really ends up living living um, longer than the plan itself. It's these one sheet um, things that we use to try to get funding for the projects, but also community members and like yourselves use to like brandish at us. Like, remember, you guys said you're going to do this. It's right here. It has your logo on it. It has your it's on page number 24. Remember this project? Um, so these are these are things that um, we're going to put more time into making sure that they're really good so that they're really effective tools for internal and external advocacy. Um, we have the, a similar situation for um, trying to get through these. Um, we, we do share the tier two projects just where they are a little bit about what they are and we have a summary table at the end of this section that kind of in two pages summarizes all of the quarter improvements where they are their extent if we have cost estimation information we put that there and then we do the same thing for the neighborhood greenways we show the overall proposed network how that relates to the land use um, what are the key elements of neighborhood greenways um, and then we again step through the individual projects and there's there's not a whole lot new here um, that you haven't seen. And we hope as, as we get closer to sharing this with city council, we'll get a few more details. We'll, we'll nail down some of those project level or the planning level cost estimates. So there's a little bit more certainty around those. Um, fill out some of this blank white space that you're seeing with additional content. Um, and then this section ends in a similar way with the tier, the tier two projects and um, at a table showing the projects. Um, and then we get into the bus network recommendations. And this is a this is newer, our new section, a new, a new sort of frame for, for information that we've shared before, but we just wanted to document um, the exercises that we went through with you all, that we went through with the community, that we went through with uh, our consultant, Jarrett Walker and Associates to um, kind of bring to light um, the, the ways that the trans, the, the transit network really isn't working for folks in this uh, plan area. Um, come up with recommendations and then sort of set those against or compare them to what TriMet is doing with its forward together plan, which is a short term um, kind of cost neutral um, uh, short term service plan for the next five years. And so we, we kind of share what were uh, this plan sort of recommendations. Um, and we share it in a more conceptual sense on this map on the ne this next page, that importance of north-south continuous service on 72nd, connecting folks up to uh, Foster and the community center, and then the, the continuous east-west service on both Woodstock and um, Flavel, really um, trying to support that new um, zoned center that's centered on uh, 72nd and Flavel. Um, and then we sort of take these recommendations, which this plan is long-term and we talked that the, the horizon for this plan is 10, 20 years. And we sort of compare it to what TriMet has done with this short-term five-year cost neutral um, forward together plan and see that they picked off quite a few of our recommendations, that continuous east-west bus service on Woodstock, uh, additional service on that line and uh, additional service on line 71 are all things that we recommended that that, that the TriMet plan, working with them, we were able to sort of have them shoehorn those things in. 
And then just identifying that there are a couple of items that, uh, that we know that the community really thinks are important and we need to find additional future opportunities to, um, to pursue. Um, Shane, uh, Misa yeah. has a question or has sure. a hand? Yeah, go for it, Misa. Hi, sorry. It had to do with that map that you were just showing of the bus line and and this yeah. and, and my neighbors it's, is what drives us the most crazy is we have yeah. a green line on Clavel mm -hmm. and it is so you can't take oh. a, straight, a straight shot to get to the green line. And I and mm -hmm. I was hoping this change would make that happen. I, and I still don't understand the logic of not having a Clavel uh, bus go straight to the green line. I mean, I, I, yeah. I don't never use the green line. I take a different one because it's just too complicated to get to the one on Clavel. It's right by my house. No, that's that's a great point. Um, and so yeah, this is speaking to what the TriMet Forward Together plan, and that's why I kind of kept we're not we're not TriMet, and I'm not trying to make excuses, but their their plan that they did was a, kind of a cost neutral. So they didn't add any more service across their whole system. What they actually did manage to do was take some service from outside of the plan area and add it. And so we're we are seeing that new service on Woodstock and on Line 71. But you're right in that on the next page, you sort of see that we don't have that continuous east-west connection that we're recommending. That's something that will have to come later and we'll have to work with TriMet to get them to, to consider later, but they weren't able to do it as a part of this short-term cost neutral exercise. So we hear that and that's why we have this table with these, these glaring missing uh, spots, just kind of saying, hey, this is still really important to folks. We need to find another way to get it done. Anna? Yeah, I'm wondering about this, um, you know, frequency and, and line situation, how TriMet is actually planning on those things, because what it comes down to is the question of how fast you get from one place to another. And um, right now, it takes forever, even from Woodstock, to go to downtown, not to mm -hmm. mention try to go to the southwest. You have to go to downtown and out again. And it's not frequent, not on either ends. So I, I'm just at a loss. I mean, I try really hard to be on public transportation, but yeah. if I miss one bus, I wait for 15 minutes and then I don't get the next bus that connects me. I mean, all of a sudden, I'm on my way from downtown out here to Woodstock for over one hour. Mm -hmm. And that's not working and if I go to the southwest it takes me almost two hours I can walk so yeah. I wonder how <laughs> not I've <seriously>. done that <laughs> <laughs> um but I I'm, I'm wondering how TriMet is actually measuring um to make those suggestions because it's not only the connectivity it's also about this kind of how much time you actually need to get to certain points those are great questions so when we were developing our recommendations, the city, the, the city of Portland, through this process, we, um, I don't remember, I can't remember if we shared these results, but our, our consultant has this tool that basically we make changes to the transit network and it produces for us a map of um, basically like a, a new Google map that allows us to say, well, if we're here and we're here and we make this change to the transit network, how much faster can we get between these two points? Um, and what that um, what that exercise basically revealed was that the recommendations that we have here, this set, this these five, were things that overall for the entire area improved access. Now I would say that what TriMet has um, adopted as their their forward together plan does actually um, really benefit um, the plan area to a greater degree than we actually were anticipating. Um, we have two new frequent, not new, but upgraded lines in the area. You have the four, which is both streamlined on Woodstock and also upgraded to frequent service. You have the same thing for the 71, upgraded to frequent service. And then something that's not shown on this map, but does really impact both the reliability of the lines in Lower Southeast, but also um, the speed, specifically the four and getting to and from downtown. Um, TriMet finally listened to community members from this area and they took the line 19, which they're renumbering as the four, um, they finally took that bus off the Ross Island Bridge and they put it on the Tillicum crossing so that it doesn't, it's not stuck in that traffic on Highway 26 crossing the river. It's on transit dedicated space. Uh, and so that's something that's not shown on this map and kind of 
it's it's kind of evidence of the complexity of transit, which is you have to look a little bit beyond just what's in inside the box that you're looking in to understand um, sort of that these impacts are cumulative and they, and they also, what, what goes on outside of the box also really matters for what happens inside of the box. Um, and so I think there are some improvements coming, but like, like Misa said, that there's still a few that we really want to see and that we're definitely going to recommend. Do you feel like that addresses what you were thinking on it? Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to speed through the rest of this. Um, we've got two sections left and they focus on, on basically, so we have our very specific sort of infrastructure type projects or recommendations. What are the things that we need to do to make sure that we're filling the gaps? Um, and that's where um, we're hoping to leverage some of our existing programs and maybe stand up some new programs. And so the first of these is something that you may have all heard about, but there is a, is a state law that Portland does have an exception to, but there is a state law that says that you need to have parking set back 20 feet from intersections and that's for safety and that's for visibility. And this is something that our pedestrian master plan, PED PDX, which was adopted in 2019, really is, is pushing us forward to do. And it's pushing us specifically to prioritize um, crossings of busy streets and especially crossings uh, of neighborhood greenways of busy streets. And so this is, um, uh, an approach that we will take with our corridor improvement projects and our and our neighborhood greenways where they cross the streets. And that's sort of the baseline. We'll expand from there where there are additional places where safety definitely calls for this approach. Another program area that we are um, this is one that we're trying to we're trying to figure out where this lives. This is sort of this program area captures the the plethora of things that we heard about local streets and their quality and um, whether it's a gravel street that has poor drainage, like you can see in this image, um, which is just, this is a great image that shows uh, exactly what folks are talking about, or if it's a lack of sidewalks. Um, and it's that combined with traffic going unsafe speeds, unsafe driving behavior. And so we're trying to find some way to capture those needs and to, and to sort of from, as soon as we have resources, basically, we know some of the places that we needed, we need to put them. We have these broad areas where we've heard and we've documented that either traffic volumes or traffic speeds aren't what they should be for local streets. And then there are streets where the pavement quality is very poor or there's just no pavement and, and that that street serves some broader transportation network function. Um, and so we just, we really didn't want to lose this feedback because it was one of the key things that, uh, that community members sort of advocated to get us to even get this grant to do this project. And then finally, we had um, one other um, sort of program to help people really take more take ownership of the streets in sort of a, in, a, in a positive way and just um, a toolkit really to use uh, streets in a way that um, can in kind of a not a scrappy way, but just a, uh, a grassroots way. Um, improve sort of the livability of the neighborhood and the feeling of ownership and, and the feeling that when you're coming into the space that this is a space, this isn't a, a street just to kind of blow through and that can really help address some of those, um, those traffic calming issues. And so Portland of the Streets is a program that has a plethora of tools, whether it's um, things like pedestrian prop plazas, intersection painting, um, parking day. Um, so it's a, it's a whole toolkit that neighborhood and community members um, can can use and, and we can, there's kind of out of the box solutions that um, the city can help with. Um, this is under development, but this is mostly housekeeping type stuff. It's um, basically where there's a land use change, where there is a, a change to a street to become a corridor or a center. Uh, some of our street classifications need to change to reflect that. And this is just going to, this is gonna be a map that documents where that needs to occur. And then our final section is about um, funding and implementation. And so here we just identify um, the likeliest funding strategy or likeliest funding mechanisms for um, those tier one priority projects and um, some potential future funding sources. Um, sorry if I sped through that at the end. I just wanna make sure that we leave us time for the rest of the items on the agenda. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing and... I know how to stop sharing. I don't know how to stop sharing. 
<laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, and have a have a short discussion if there's anything folks uh, want to talk about or have thoughts and comments about. I'd love to hear. Is there anything in the chat, Bill? Um, Pam had a suggestion for oh. an approach to LIDs and mm -hmm. uh, considering a deferred payback period, uh, such as uh, currently applies in Arrow Heights for their LID. I'm giving you early uh, comments and feedback while I'm here. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> Nancy, I, I saw you. Uh... Yeah, uh, I have a concern for the the um, food food desert issue and the number of seniors um, that are going to be in the city, particularly east of here, actually from 130th to Mount Scott, with no, you know, so that's that's east of us. But looking at the realities of our community, which are that the buses don't serve people who work on the other side of town as Anna was saying, you know, and I think that we have to recognize that this is not going to become a city without cars as part of the transportation. And the things that are being done in many cases on streets that um, make driving dangerous for both cars and bicyclists because of the the ways they're set up. I, I mean, I just think that there's has to be a lot more acknowledgement that this community is getting older and we're not gonna be driving, riding bicycles. I mean, you know, I'm 83 and I work all over town. There's no way I could do what I do by bus. Yeah, you know, I'm not gonna ride a bicycle. So I just really, want you to, in the in the names of equity whenever you think about doing something think about who is going to be there like the dump the the trash 45th okay i live off 45th the number of those white poles that have been driven over because the trash trucks couldn't get around the corner because of how many of those white poles were up I mean, just have to start thinking about the fact that we do work, we do need to shop, we do, I don't believe we're going to become a total deliver the groceries to me, it's too expensive for one thing, so please put that layer of elders into your thinking when you do things, just... <laughs> I keep seeing ways that they're not, you know, that our older population is not being considered. Thank you for that. Um, if there, if there are other specific examples, um, maybe in in your official comments of ways that you think that the projects are maybe making it harder to um, harder for you and and folks that you know to get around, um, I'd love I'd love to hear some more of those. So thank you. Well, Anna will be a good one to be thinking about that one too, because I think she walks more than I do <laughs> and, and is more aware. I mean, you're actually lucky on Woodstock. You actually have a laundromat and you have a credit union. 82nd Avenue, literally 82nd Avenue does not have a single credit union or a laundromat on it. I mean, you talk about not having services, <laughs> you know, it's like... There are several ways that this community could be improved for people that do have to walk uh, to get places. Thanks. Tim? Yeah, I just, um, I want to first of all say that um, I think Nancy is doing great for 83 years old. Um, <laughs> uh, I was curious more of a logistic thing because what I, to me, it's more straightforward when you make a proposal of a plan to the city about zoning and certain issues like that. But then when you start to talk transportation, like I don't really understand how much influence something like this would have over TriMet policies or TriMet planning. Um, you know, I, I guess maybe it's just an education for me and understanding, like, is that really going to 
do any good to have that as part of the plan? <laughs> yeah, and um, I mean, I will say that this plan substantially shaped what is in forward together for this area. So I, it's a pretty big victory, I think, this process. Um, yeah, we, we might have been looking at no changes or no improvements or no additional service in Lower Southeast if it weren't for the work that we did here. So um, it does have, it definitely does have impact. Um, and then going forward, this is something that planners in conversations with TriMet can continue to point to when TriMet does have additional services like, hey, we have this thing. <laughs> um, so it, it it is something for us to really lean on, and then it becomes something also for the community to lean on. This is this is a was like a substantially like a community process, and so when TriMet says, "Hey, we're, we've got some money to do something with," what do you guys think? Or or if they say, "Oh, we're going to change something. We're not going to add any service, but we're going to change something." This is something community members can also point to. So it does have um, have power and clout. Um, I'm going to just take these last two comments and then we need to move to our next agenda item. Um, but any, any other thoughts I would love to, um, if you guys want to contact me email or, or set up a time. Anna. Yeah. Um, so on, on the, on the public transport, I, I wonder, you know, not only the elder need to go around, there are also a large teenage group that needs to go around. And I wonder if, if that's part of the, you know the the planning to figure out where those kids need to go um so they can do so on their own um and um also to have to have fun because that's the next generation that get gets educated um by force to use public transportation if they don't want to go with their parents <laughs> um <laughs> so yeah. And if if they become educated as you know, oh yeah, public transportation actually works, um, then they are much more likely to keep using it when they are of age to get their driver's license. That's one thing I, I think that should be kept in, in mind. And then another thing is because, you know, that's the United States of America, Portland is a car driving city and are there any um, attempts or programs to bring car sharing in? Because that needs usually different requirements for parking and logistics of how those are moving back and forth between different locations. And I know a lot of cities had like several attempts to try and it only worked like after the third one. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have quite the history with car sharing too. And I can't answer that question in a lot of detail. So that's something that I might have to get back to you on. Um, but those are both good things to keep in mind. Um, Julie? Um, yeah, I was, um, the other day on Twitter, Streetcar posted something. I was like, oh, I wish we could have that out here because I'm in Lens and, you know, it's the streetcar is really cool. And, and then um, someone had posted a, like a, like their own like planning thing for like future routes and stuff. And while they won't go, I don't know what the timeline is either, but they're not going to go specifically in this neighborhood, but they're like right on the edges, like on um, like Foster and Division. I mean, there are a bunch, they're like coming out this way. And I wondered like, you know, do the different groups talk to each other? Cause you know, here we're like, oh, we want more buses and bikes and things here. But if there's like streetcars over here, you know, we they would still we could still use them if like the buses went to them or you know what I mean like they all do they do do you all talk to each other I guess is my question or do you know about the streetcar thing or like because that could influence like bus routes and you know because they're wanting to make more like kind of like what we're doing here like making more um, people centered you know, pockets, especially out here where we don't really have that as much as like the inner, inner um, neighborhoods. So I just wonder like, you know, I mean, I can, I can find that in Twitter, share it in the chat anyway, just cause it's neat. But um, if there's any kind of, yeah, about that. This, the city has, I've just posted in the chat, the city in 2009, we did a Portland streetcar plan um, and it does show a line coming down Foster. Um, um, yeah, I guess, so in summary, um, <laughs> or in short, I guess, 
we do we do talk to each other. Um, I I don't know exactly what you're talking about on Twitter, but um, and we're probably not in conversation with with uh, um, advocates on Twitter, but about this specific thing. But um, yeah, I mean we we talk about high capacity transit. I think right now um, the regional transportation plan is going through a refresh, and we look at if the old high capacity transit map, which includes streetcar, sort of has the right lines on it and uh, I'm not sure what the latest is on that, but um, that's where sort of our intent for the next 5, 10, 15 years of streetcar would be articulated. And also in this plan that I shared. Um, that's a good question. We need to move on to the next agenda item, which uh, I think Bill is going to share about the public engagement strategy for this. Sorry for squeezing your time, Bill. Oh, uh, sure. Um, all right. Uh, we wanted to share a bit about what we're looking at in terms of a, a potential uh, approach to spreading the word and seeking people's input in terms of once we release the discussion draft. And as I'm mentioning before, we are aiming to release the discussion draft in late April. Uh, this is a list of the approaches we're considering at this point. We're looking at creating an online open house uh, that would be open during uh, the full six weeks of the, the public engagement period. And this would be something that would summarize the plans, proposals, and include some survey questions uh, that accompany each one of the, 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 the summary topics. And the ideas would be translating it into uh, Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Russian uh, to really broaden who is uh, who can access this. And we're also looking at having a more of a real-time online open house, maybe a Zoom event, or you might call it a webinar, where we'd be presenting the proposals and providing an opportunity for some uh, Q&A and, and comments. Um, we're also looking at uh, what we often do for planning projects, having a map app that shows the, the draft zoning map changes, and there would be an opportunity for people to comment on those zone changes. Uh, and really, it'd be you could have parcel specific uh, comments in, in terms of the way that tool works. We're also looking at the idea of tabling at community gathering places and events. And I, I could share a list of uh, uh, places we've identified up to now. We're also looking at doing a, a mailer potentially to all the, the, the addresses in the plan area and distributing flyers about the plan and how to learn about it online uh, at schools and community gathering places, as well as doing some target outreach to uh, the Latinx and Asian communities who haven't always been uh, fully engaged in this project, as well as uh, reaching out to renters. And in the early part of the project, we had done some uh, stakeholder interviews and we may be uh, continuing those, those discussions uh, with those individuals again. And, uh, we're also wanting to visit neighborhood association meetings as well as the uh, 82nd Avenue Business Association to uh, let people uh, know what's in the plan, how they can um, chime in. But um, before I, I mention some of our tabling ideas, I'm just curious if people have thoughts, what are the best ways to reach people in the community? Oops. Sorry. And uh, I can't see the screen very well the way my screen sharing is. Uh, uh, Shane, if someone does uh, have a suggestion, uh, yeah, definitely I'm bring not, that up. I'm not seeing it at the moment, but. Oh, Scott. How about school engagement with kids? I wonder about that being on here. It could be difficult with the timing of it being summer. Um, mm. But that was what I was thinking that we haven't necessarily checked in with kids as much. Yeah, and uh, the school communities are also a place that uh, where you can often reach a more diverse uh, part of the community than uh, than is sometimes the case elsewhere. Yeah. Misa, um, I know in Brentwood, Darlington, I actually have completely quit social media, but there are these very active social media groups in this neighborhood. Um, one's called Connected Families, and I'm not sure the other one, um, but there's three big ones. And that's like a major way to get uh, word of mouth. And you would have to ask someone other than me for their names. I know one's called Burntwood Darlington Connected Families, um, but I, I'm not sure the other two, but that's a great way to get a lot of uh, information out. 
Yeah, thanks. If anyone else knows uh, what those uh, social uh, platforms might be, uh, definitely share it with us. And Julie says in the chat, local farmers markets. Yeah, um, in fact, that's kind of a segue. Places we're looking at possibly setting up a you know, tabling with information uh, about the plan and you know, how to provide input. We're looking at you know, places where, where people gather, like a grocery outlet, uh, potentially the, the, the Portland Mercado, Open Foster, Mount Scott Community Center, Brentwood Darlington Community Center, the Woodstock Library, uh, Asian Health and Service Center up in uh, Foster. Uh, Department of Human Services, which has a, 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 a facility right there by Favela 82nd and the Francis Center. And uh, one thing we're also interested in hearing about is uh, we're, Harrison uh, has, was looking at events, you know, where could we table? And it looked like some of the farmers markets in the area were starting up more in June. And that uh, the, the core part of when we're doing our outreach would be get more in May and the early part of June. So if, if people know of events, we, we definitely want to hear about them. And I think Anna and uh, mm -hmm. Scott have their hands up. So I think the idea of farmers markets are actually really great. Um, and another idea, I think, um, especially in, in the area where, where this project is focused, is to maybe have some material that you could hand out to people when they do their block parties or neighborhood parties. Because this is when people really get engaged with their neighborhood. It's already their, their focus at that moment in time. Um, and then they start to, to have something to, to really discuss of what that future might be and to get engaged. Also, you know, the businesses themselves, they, I, I know on Woodstock, they always do these kind of, um, how do you call it, these kind of special days where, where they celebrate the, <laughs> the business uh, street uh, and the corridor thing. And there are really always a lot of people out there. And just to have information material out that they can include so it's not necessarily that Peabot or, you know, whoever needs to come, <laughs> you know, you don't have to, to bring your people out, but that the information material is there. Right. I think that would be super helpful. Sure. So that's probably on us. We could probably look at the Woodstock Business Association and see what events they might uh, have coming up. And we could, we could look into the farmer's markets in the area and see when they're starting up. Right. And the I think one is really busy, so good. And Scott, you've got your hand up. Thanks. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about, just if y'all are the one being out there and tabling, uh, parks can be a nice place. And one of the things that got me thinking about that was that the Brentwood Darlington Community Center doesn't really get that much foot traffic to it, but the Brentwood Park, which is right next to it and sort of connected to it, um, after the middle school over there, um, it gets a ton of families out there and there's like uh, volleyball that happens out there and some soccer league things and that can be a fine time if it, again, that might time out better with the summer schedule of things. Oh, great, now thanks for the suggestion. And there's the community garden pretty close by as well. Okay, any other thoughts? And uh, I want to give um, Anna a little time to share with uh, what the students came up with. Um, and yeah, you know, anyone, it uh, doesn't have to be right now. Definitely, uh, we'd love to hear from you if you have suggestions as to how we can get the, the word out or you know where we could table and such. So uh, looking forward to that. Um, so I'm gonna uh, move us on and actually I'm gonna wrap things up and turn things over to Anna. Uh, just to remind people in terms of where we are with the draft plan, uh, we are going to be refining the, the draft plan based on your input and the technical advisory committee as input as well. We're, we're aiming to have the draft plan uh, done by late April. It could be early May. Um, and discussion draft public engagement, again, that's going to be during that six, at least six week period from uh, late April through early June. Um, the next PAC meeting, it's, that's to be determined. It may be in June. Uh, we'd love to have uh, you take part in reviewing some of the public feedback 
and uh, seeing if you have suggestions for refinements and how we might respond to that feedback. So I'm going to stop sharing here. Any uh, questions? And I know we have we don't have a lot of time. I think we have about eight minutes or so. Or and if people are willing to stay a few more minutes, uh, I don't know if you could share. That would be great. Yeah, I try to be. I try to be quick. Let me see if I can share. Okay, can everybody see this? Yep. Okay, so there are two studios that I taught in this area um, each time in the fall. One was 21 and one 22 um, um, with a graduate architecture students at Portland State. Um, and um, they were concerned with the concept of the sponge city and uh, developing rainwater typologies. And just to broaden the scope even more than what we already heard, um, I use the Earth overshoot day um, as a stepping point. So I don't know how familiar you are with that thing. Um, the overshoot day is the mark when humanity's demand for biological resources exceeded what Earth generates in a year. So last year it was um, July 28th, but if everybody would live like the United States, um, like our everyday life, um, it would be March 13th. So we are already passed. Um, which is, you know, to say we need to change our understanding of how we live and we need to understand what are our urban environments and what architecture contributes to that. Um, so the studio of the Sponge City was really aiming to empower architecture students to develop a proactive stance on architecture's expressive capacity to describe essential change in these kind of very fundamental framework conditions in urbanism. So, and this studio investigates an approach to a networked understanding of space in favor of an increased appreciation of public space, which means programming and sequencing the space between and into buildings is understood as essential to environmental and social changes. Um, so this studio is really concerned with the ways in which architecture can become an implement for practices reconfiguring urban space to represent public action and um, changes in our way of life. Um, taking this kind of symbolic power of rainwater, and you might all remember New York City's subway disaster, which is depicted here, um, this studio combines these kind of urban architectural strategies to explore rainwater as a guide for typological experiments. Rainwater in the urban environment became first and foremost a um, managerial task where it's collected, confined, drained, piped away. And um, we were trying to go beyond um, this moment and try to investigate the potentials rainwater and the sponge city holds to assist in these kind of urban cohab cohabitations and transformative designs for public spaces. Um, so making visible these kind of interstitches of urban life from creating unique microclimates, feeding plants and animals, filtering toxins, producing food, and all those things. Sponge City um, is really exploring these potentials of natural and architectural expressions to mitigate our contaminating nature of our lifestyles and also the protocols related to these productions of our built environment. So I had asked, and so this is just to give you the one year we focused on 52nd um, and Flavel, and the second year we, which is one of the um, red um, rectangles. And the next year we were looking at 72nd and Flavel. And these green dots are the main green spaces that we were trying to connect, which um, one is uh, the Brentwood Park and the, um, the farms that are associated, the learning gardens. 
Um, one is uh, uh, Errol Heights Park, um, close to 52nd and Flavel. And the other green spot is not as significant of a park, um, but it's a park beyond that school um, that's uh, on um, Flavel and close to 72nd. So, um, and the students really took their, their um, research and cartographic imaginations like really, really broad, like looking at much, much larger environments of understanding what does it actually mean to engage with rainwater. We have sedimentation, we have the rivers, we have, you know, all these things that are coming together. Um, and here you see these uh, little dots that are, you know, condensing at one point, that's uh, outlets of sewer systems. And um, so, and this connection with the rainwater coming from, you know, our surrounding hills um, has also a lot to do with those questions of sedimentation and toxins that are getting flooded in um, into our waterways. So the students did, you know, considerable research on this. I don't go far too far into this. So this led into understanding these much larger um, questions of pollution um, and um, disruptions in our natural cycles, especially with the sewer systems and you know our forestry and all these things that we keep thinking about um, and showing these really dense connections um, between all these systems. So this particular student then said like, okay, I need to figure out what I can do when I know all this kind of gigantic cycles. Um, and uh, they really went into um, investigating capillary action um, and the symbiosis of red alders um, with um, certain bacteria um, who would eat up um, nitrogen. Um, which then actually helps to have a lot of growth and plants. And he sought to bring that in to um, uh, Flavel and 72nd um, as a rainwater hub, and then to develop from 72nd all the way to 52nd, um, this kind of rainwater growing um, pathway. Um, where these little huts that you see here, where that tree grows in the middle, is actually used for food production. Um, so this is how it looks like. Um, there is a lot of rainwater collection in these towers going on, um, which has, you know, aside from normal rainwater uh, collection, when it's actually raining, there's also a lot of condensation uh, systems, uh, water collection possible that they investigated. And then you have, um, even in the, in the dry period of the year, um, you can actually use that rainwater within these rainwater hubs um, to grow food. And then, you know, it becomes this kind of small business drivers. It becomes community spaces where people care about the food, um, learn about um, nutritional values. And um, this is very close located next to the school, um, as you can see on the left side. Um, and I know Peabot planners will just go crazy with this, but in this whole area, 72nd is gone. Um, and students were really asking, how can we reduce these kind of uh, traffic impacts in those environments where we consider we want to um, get rid of toxins. We want to make sure we have clean rainwater and clean food production. So that was part. Be radical. Um, another uh, student investigated much more the questions of the mundane ways of how we investigate or experience rainwater in, in the town. Um, I think everybody can relate to those images. Um, and then with all this understanding of the toxins, the climate crisis, um, that is, it became for this particular student, this kind of very apocalyptic uh, imagery. And they just go crazy and say like, oh my God, what shall I do? I, there's nothing that I can really change in that world. And then um, 
slowly she developed and said, okay, I have this weird environment. Why don't I use, if, if plants are already taking over, if we have those imageries developed, why don't we transform that into not this kind of hostile environment, but actually start to think about how can we have um, food production associated with these kind of very radical greeneries that are taking over our cities. Um, and that became the, oops, I'm sorry, became the driver for her to investigate permaculture strategies. Permaculture is a way of having a very layered uh, way of growing plants, especially food related plants, um, and have a very productive environment. Um, that's kind of almost self sustaining. Um, and her uh, vision for the neighborhood, especially with all our gravel streets we have, was like, no, we are not going to pave them and put parking there and, 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 but um, really enhance these people who are already living there or who want to engage in this kind of uh, lifestyle to have them move there um, and to develop along those streets these enhanced kind of permacultural environments. Um, and then start to implement small food related businesses or food carts, which you see on the bottom image. That's kind of her very first idea of implementation of small things. Um, and here you see um, her way of not going to the main streets for her uh, urban investigation, but to go off to the next street over, um, propose a much higher density. Can you actually see my my mouse if I go over here? A higher density. Yes. Okay, that helps. A higher density along 72nd, um, but then develop these kind of greenery food production streets um, right next to it and also connect um, the kind of learning gardens, the farms um, that we have um, with these uh, green streets um, all the way down to the school. And then she proposed to have like um, these red squares where like special interactions where there are either food cars or greenhouses or public engagement about these kind of related um, small businesses. And down here, this little square is what she proposed um, on this corner here. Um, which is um, a school educational park and um, after school program opportunity for uh, kids to learn in greenhouses um, how to how food grows in the first place and then also how to clean it, how to cook it um, and get an idea of how these cycles actually work and what healthy food actually means. Um, then I also had a student, um, she is from India and she was missing a lot of her, uh, food traditions, um, which were very seasonal, um, and were related to the feeling of certain seasons and to certain emotions. And what you see is on the first row here, she has these specific seasonal, foods that came to her mind, then there in the next row, these kind of obvious environments that we know. Um, and the, the facial expressions you see in the third row are these um, uh, Indian dances and uh, facial expressions that come with these associations with certain seasons. Um, and it was a very important part for her to figure out her identity in this kind of understanding um, of food culture in the United States. And she said, okay, if I can bring this kind of seasonal idea, then I gonna introduce that also um, like very similar to the previous um, project in this kind of connecting streets. But this is one that connects um, here the learning gardens and Grandwood Park through those kind of um, green produce food growing uh, streets all the way to 52nd um, and from there then all the way down to Errol Heights Park and she introduced that you see here a little sketch um, a modular way um, of building um, little uh, kiosk and little houses and some larger houses. 
Um, and this is kind of what she, what she envisioned um, for this place. Like it's a very playful water collecting, water um, draining, water filtration systems integrated with these kind of food growing and food producing um, street and walkways. Um, and then um, she had a very lively vision for that um, community plaza center with like um, children's playgrounds, with music venues, with farmers markets, with little water features um, to just um, have these kind of, and you see here all these little uh, tiny modular um, buildings that she introduced where she said like they can be used um, according to the seasons um, just made into you know farm stands or little kitchens or food uh, um, how do you say cleaning stations which we learned from actually Black Future Farms that that's one of the most important features that they are looking for having these little food cleaning uh, uh, kitchens all over the neighborhood because this is what they realize brings people together to talk about food and to exchange different cultures um, and come together. It's very important for teenagers. We were talking about that too, where they say like this is how they reach them the best to have like really serious talks. So this filtered into these kind of um, project developments. Um, then this is uh, also um, a, a project that um, started the research on a much, much larger scale, um, looking really at the whole valley, the river valley, um, and how rainwater would um, uh, filtrate into uh, our city, and then realizing how much uh, toxins are actually um, coming with it. And this student developed a um, strategy um, for phytomediation, which means there are certain plants who can soak up uh, certain toxins and store them um, within their tissue. Um, and he proposed a plaza on 52nd and Flavel, um, which again is mostly community driven, um, some housing involved, um, very attentive to what's already there. Um, just adding a few more things and larger engagements. Um, and um, also looking in these kind of possibilities, where can we take up depave things, so to speak, um, and uh, has a very detailed um, and minute <laughs> strategy to actually implement um, along the streets and um, within the, the growing neighborhood um, where those phytomediation uh, plants could be placed. And then they of course have to be replaced over time once they are filled up with toxins. So that was a very complex um, system, very difficult to show on a small screen like this. Um, and then uh, the last project I want to show you today is um, one project. Um, the student had a question of, man, we have this, you know, built environment, and then in Portland, everybody is like, you know, driving, and it's it's such a weird environment. But then there is everybody so excited about nature, and there is this kind of weird idea about this pristine nature that you go out to and you drive out to, and you know, with all your um, fancy clothing that's also highly toxic. <laughs> so, and um, this student also has a background in um, vet veterinary medicine. Um, so, and they started to combine these questions of um, what can I do for cohabitation um, with different animals and was really focusing on birds mainly um, and saying like, yeah, we need to think about these kind of layered environments. Um, and also, as you might know, our urban environments, there are some species who adapt really well to urban environments and others not. But the ones that are really adapt well, 
uh, tend to overpopulate. Um, so there is no way of um, confining them. So they become a nuance. And so there is um, there's a question of how can we create that biodiversity when we think about what certain animals need um, and how these um, you know, animals and habitats are, are created together. And um, this investigation um, was all about bird flight pattern um, overlaid over the, the project area. And um, they really expanded it out to Johnson Creek to say like, huh, where are those birds actually coming? How far are they going in uh, the urban environment? Do we need to figure out what the boundaries are? And um, that really poses a question of how are we perceiving the idea of higher density in urban environments um, inclusive of animals or not, inclusive of plants or not, and if yes, which ones. So, and so it got higher and higher in, in these kind of layerings and details of investigations, um, and then um, they developed this um, strategy path for for bird migration into the urban environment. Here you see some of those kind of um, um, strategies for having focal points um, for, for large tree growth. Um, and for our area, um, that translated into this kind of layering um, of, of these um, habitats, I guess. So you have the trees that are really sticking out. Um, and then you have these kind of the humans are living down here. <laughs> So, and he proposed a rehab center for, for birds mainly because um, they do get really injured um, and there is not enough uh, space for, for rehab, uh, for, for animal rehab. Um, so that's something he proposed um, on 72nd and Flavel, um, close to the school. And he proposed this kind of, um, layered bridge that would uh, come, if you can see, the, the school is somewhere out here, I'm sorry, it's it's too small. Um, but there would be like a bridge building going right over the, the crossroad um, that would contain um, several um, possibilities for, for various uh, animals and plants to actually create their, their habitat and to live there and also have the school kids crossing through there in order to learn about animals and plants and how they are rehabilitated. Um, and then that would just go over all the way, walkways um, with animal education and life cycle education, um, all the way to the learning gardens. Um, yeah, I think I, I stop here. And I just want to say a big thank you. So there are many, many more. So I can show you a lot more of those projects. Um, but I also want to say a big thank you to the TGM project team, especially Marty Stockton, Bill Cunningham, Brian Poole, and Cassie Bello for their feedback because they came for workshops and spoke with the students. And it was incredibly important to the students. Um, to hear that actually their ideas really matter. And because the students always feel like that's super out there, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense <laughs> what we are doing, um, but it's, um, it's something where, where they got the feedback where they said like, oh my God, we can actually help to broaden the understanding of who do we need to talk to if we wanna have future change and develop those future visions. So that was super helpful. So thank you. Thanks so much, Anna. It's, it's so uh, refreshing in a way, uh, <laughs> learning from the students and, and seeing their perspectives and things. I think as someone who's a city employee, we're always, we have we, we have our constraints <laughs> we're working with that. And so seeing, seeing something where you're tackling a problem in a more expansive way is always, is, is really interesting. And uh, uh, Anna Pam had the idea of somehow including some of the students' ideas in the plan, and I don't know if there's some summary that could be you know, worked into uh, maybe an appendix to the plan. 
because uh, it's um, it definitely is more interesting than like uh, the land use diagrams we have in terms of uh, spurring uh, ideas. But Bill, I mean, you've uh, referenced already uh, in the early draft the health data, and this might tie to that as well as the city's climate uh, policies. So, you know, maybe there is a nexus, you know, even within the planning box that uh, <laughs> normally confines you. Yeah, we'll think about that. Um, and, uh, you know, BPS, I should mention, has uh, re recently launched a, a, a city resilience effort. And I think they're still scoping that in terms of how do you create a city that's more resilient uh, in the face of climate change and addresses urban heat islands and such. So the, it's a topic that's uh, just the various, you know, many pieces related to resilience uh, is, is definitely uh, uh, emerging as a, a major topic. Thank you. But thanks, everyone. And Anna, thanks so much for the presentation. Yeah. It's definitely a food for thought and uh, uh, make, makes me realize how little I know about some of these systems. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and I always wonder, you know, how how this can, I mean, we, we, we start to have those kind of research and investigations and they're, you know, very rudimentary if you really look at them deeper. Um, but I always feel like there's so much potential to actually help to change some visions and some directions and also to know who we actually need to ask to, to find collaborations for, you know, even for, for vision statements or for, you know, vision plans. Um, and also how to formulate those zonings. I mean, I'm just always startled. <laughs> and this plan area is fairly unique for the east side in that you have spring water, the spring water at Johnson okay. Creek so close by, and you have the slope, you know, the aerial heights. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot draining down towards uh, the creek and maybe thinking about how the whole system works. But um, um, I know we stayed well beyond our eight o'clock time. So um, I'm sorry. <laughs> thanks everyone for uh, your interest oh, and you. uh, we try to we squeeze a lot into an hour and a half so <laughs> thanks everyone for 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 being part of this yeah thank you and we're looking forward to uh, you're sending us comments we'll take a look at some of the chat and and um we have a note taker so we're, we're definitely tracking what was said today but uh I'd encourage you as well just to send in comments at any rate all right. Thanks, everyone. And uh, have a good evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye now. Oh, here I send. Get that all. Oops. Yeah, uh, there were a couple of